<laughs> and today there's quite a few things we want to talk about with you, and, and hopefully, hopefully you enjoy the session. You'll find quite a lot of it, if you're a parent, fairly confronting. So the key is just to be open emotionally. It's so interesting too that so many are on the left hand side and there aren't any on the right hand side. This is an anti-male thing going on. But they expect that right. Oh true, maybe an anti-female thing going on. You're the one in trouble, that's okay. Yeah. Hello everyone. I'm up front and centre now at things, because you've got a PA system special so you can hear me. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to be talking about parenting today. Uh, it's something I feel quite passionate about and about children. Um, I'm actually not a parent in this lifetime yet, so um, but what I feel that we're going to present today is uh, God's truth on the issue on the matters and um, I feel quite firm about them but please don't misrepresent my firmness as any lack of compassion for uh, dealing with little beings in your care because I understand that's quite a big, big deal um, and I, I guess I have um, been processing some emotions about having had some kids and maybe not doing such a good job about it myself. So what we wanted to do today is uh, present as much of the material that you've been handed. So all of you have a handout, but uh, you'll notice it's six pages long, which is the longest handout I've ever given you. And right at the beginning I say this is not a comprehensive discussion about the subject of parents and children. So in other words, there's quite a lot of other material we could talk about besides what we've listed. But what we decided to do when we created this outline was to give you a fairly good overview of what's going on in terms of looking after children. And, I, and here we're not just talking about children that are young, but rather children that are even right up to their adult ages, and because the same principles apply right the way through. We'd like to have as much of your participation as possible, but what we thought was we'd, we'd actually go through a section and then if you have questions about that particular section, we'll have a little session of, say, five minutes at the end of, the of that section to discuss those questions that you have, and then we'd go on to the next session. And the reason why is there's actually 11 sessions, and if we plug the way through them, that means only about 15 minutes per session uh, for the time that we've got today. So, so what we want to do is present some things in 10 to 15 minutes and then have five or so minutes after each session after each section to actually for you to ask questions. So Tris I think has a what is it? Yeah, he's got a roving mic so that everyone can hear the question that you have. Bit of direction on the mic Jesus. If you yeah. can just not um, turn it on or off because we'll know if you do because <laughs> it interferes with the sound system. And if you hold the mic up like that, it's much better than if you hold it down like that. You can hear the difference in when I hold the mic up directional and when I hold it down like that. So if you hold the mic up like that when you're asking your question, that means everyone will be able to hear you. All right, so when you come to question. Some of you get so nervous when you have to hold the mic that you won't want to ask the question. <laughs> so try to just allow yourself to feel your nervousness and continue with your question because it's really important that you ask questions. Tomorrow's session will be a lot different. Um, what I'm hoping is that any of those of you who are young in the audience, and particularly tomorrow there'll be more people coming along, more children coming along. And I want to involve the children a lot in the session tomorrow. So, so hopefully uh, the session tomorrow will be quite interesting. And what we want to do tomorrow is focus more on the personal issues that you're facing with your children. So we'll have both, both parents and children up the front um, to talk about some of their issues and we'll raise what the principles are, if you like, during, for those particular issues that you raise. So that'll be tomorrow's session. So I suppose we better get started. Yes. And to start, I think we were going to just go over a, a brief review of what is our soul and mm. uh, what it's made up of. Yeah. So can you remember what your soul is? Let <laughs> me get my uh, notepad the way you're writing it. 
So you solve this. Your emotions first, right? It's uh, emotions, passions, desires, memories, aspirations, somebody said. Perspirations. No, no. Personality. Personality. Anything else? Intentions, yeah. And so forth, right? So that's your soul. So when you have a child, you're interrelating with the child soul to soul. So that's the first thing to understand. Many of us try to interact, inter interact with our children from our mind to their mind. But that is actually not the way they are used to interacting. Straight away, they, from the time they are conceived, they are interacting with you, soul to soul. So we both have a spirit body, both have a material body, but if you use your mind, you are skipping over all of this soul stuff. So that's a very important thing to understand with regard to relating with your children. Does that make sense? Okay. And the second important point would be that when our children incarnate, that their soul is pristine and doesn't have any um, injuries or damage as yet. But from the moment of incarnation, or well, just after conception, then the child is like a sponge for everything around it, and it's immediately feeling all of the emotions within its body. Yeah. So. So the key thing for you to bear, bear in mind when we're talking about this discussion, we're going to be trying to focus you back onto what your emotions are every time. Not on what you're thinking they are, but rather what they actually are. Because your children are the best reflectors back at you as to what your emotions actually are. And that's one very, very important point that you'll be carrying away with you today. And one thing I'd like to mention though is that We'll make a lot of comments about parenting during the, during the day and because many of you have been parents, many of you are going to start to feel quite judged, right? Where you feel like, wow, you know, we didn't know that, didn't know that, didn't know that. And after a while, the amount of things that you don't know piles up and then you start getting down on yourself. And what we'd like to try to do is encourage you not to do that, not to get down on yourself, just to have an open mind about it and also open with your feelings. So if you feel sad about something you haven't done that you realise now you should have done, just let yourself have a cry about it, right? Or just let yourself connect with your emotions about it. So you might actually be connecting with some law of compensation issues and rather than going straight into the judgement about, oh, I did it wrong, I did it wrong, just allow yourself to actually feel those emotions related to that. Yeah, a lot of times what will happen too is that you have this feeling of anger maybe towards us saying, uh, you know, how dare they say that, that can't be right, you know, those kind of things. Remember, every time you're in anger, it's because there's an emotion underneath the anger. So allow yourself to get into that emotion rather than staying in the anger-based emotion. It's very important to allow yourself to step down. Remember, on the natural love path, you may be very, very tempted to actually change your actions without changing your emotions. So you might hear some of this material today and then feel like you need to just change your actions and start trying to change your actions. And if you do it that way, I can guarantee you it will not work. The reason why is because every interaction you're having with your child is soul to soul. So the only way that things are really going to change in your interactions with your children are if something changes inside of your own soul. Does that make sense to everyone? very important to understand that. So let's get started then on the first section. Now note the reason why I put numbers by them this time is tomorrow when we'll be going through these different things with your own personal experiences we will often refer to the number or the point that isn't isn't being followed in that in that transaction. Does that make sense? So if you can remember to bring these notes along with you tomorrow and when we're asking personal questions, when you're dealing with personal issues, 
will be able to actually refer to those points of what, what you're not keeping in mind or what you're not remembering or this feeling associated with this particular issue. So these points are ways for us to actually help you recognise what's going on within yourself. So, the first section we wanted to talk about was the pristine soul of God. That, that is that our children are not really our children, they come from God, and we're just really the guardians or caretakers until they're able to really exercise their own free will. So there's some... Diane? <laughs> I thought you were giving me the nod. No, I'm just holding your hand. <laughs> Sorry, I just like holding your hand. <laughs> I've still got my training wheels on. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I lost my track. Yeah, she's, she's so influenced by me, she can see. So, if the child has a pristine soul condition when it incarnates, that means that it has no damage whatsoever at the moment of conception. So right at the moment of conception, every single child is pure in its emotional experience, is pure in its soul. Now it's very important to understand that because what I've heard some and uh, many parents in fact say, oh that child from the moment it was born it was just a hard, hard work, you know. Now the whole reason why that is the case is for something other than the fact that the child has a problem. Because the child at the time of conception did not have a problem. Right? That being, being the case, the only place that the child's problems can come from is its environment. And the most, the biggest influence in its environment is mum and dad. So that's where we need to start looking. If, we, if our child from the time of birth is having different issues, even if they're physical issues like sicknesses and diseases, we need to look at our own emotions because there is something in it emotionally for us. Now, when I say something emotionally for us, a lot of times it won't be just for us. It might be grandparents have passed down this emotion to the parents who then passed this emotion to the child. So bear in mind it's just something that we need to clear away from ourselves rather than looking at it from a point of view of judgment. I want to try to keep you away from judgment today. Right? Because many of you are going to be tempted to get into it. Today. And the reality is that the majority of our soul damage that we carry around now came from our own childhood as well. And so really, this is, we're pivotal people in that we can start to clear away that soul damage so that our children can benefit from that. And it's, it's a multi-generational issue. So it's quite an empowering place that we're in at the moment. So, so let's get started with it. Here's our child's soul. When it first incarnates, you could think of it as a blank slate. Or you, maybe a better illustration is think of it as a sponge. So it's just this sponge in a pristine state, just like a sponge you'd go to the supermarket and get off the shelf. You know what they like? Totally clean, no mud in them or anything like that. Just a sponge ready to be used, right? Totally clean. That's what your child is at the time of conception. Now from that moment on, just like a sponge, it soaks up everything from its environment. So the child, remember, before it came, still has personality. Does that make sense? So God created each of us with individual personalities. But what's happening is we've got our environment feeding us particularly emotions. So things are coming from outside of the child, entering the child through its emotional state, basically. And this is happening right at the moment of conception onwards, not from birth, from conception. So imagine for a moment if the mother, right at the moment of, you know, a few days after conception, she realises she's pregnant, and it's her, it's her ninth child, and she's had a terrible time with eight children before that, she feels, how much is she going to feel like she wants to have this child? Not very much, eh? And if she has a husband who's away all the time, working for the other eight children and herself, and, uh, and not having much quality of life, she'll probably feel even less inclined to, to feel joyous about her pregnancy, right? 
Now that emotion is straight away being soaked up by the child, right in that condition. Does that make sense? So the emotion that you feel of even about your pregnancies, and this is, applies to the male as well as the female. So let's say, let's say the woman gets pregnant in a relationship and the man in the relationship has a real hard time with the fact that she's pregnant. So let's say she, he feels like he, you know, he doesn't want her to be pregnant. He would prefer to have an abortion than to be pregnant. Now that emotion is coming from the man to the child. Does that make sense to everyone? Right from the moment that child is incarnated. Now you imagine just that one emotion and what damage it's going to do for the rest of its life. Quite a lot, eh? Because it felt not wanted from the, from the moment it could feel. And the problem with accessing those emotions is pretty hard too for the child because these emotions are emotions that it doesn't have an intellect about. So it doesn't have a memory of an experience that caused it to feel the way it feels. It just, as a part of itself, feels that way right from the time it was even born and even before then. So that's a pretty damaging thing. So if you can think of these emotions that it's getting from an environment as a sponge, this soul as a sponge, and the emotions are getting passed into the soul, and the personality of the soul will determine how the child responds to the emotion. Does that make sense? Think of it as a pristine soul, just like a sponge soaking in everything from its environment. Can you say something? No. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just probably the, the point that um, maybe not as clear that the, the soul doesn't have any defense at all from what's coming, coming at it from all of these different um, parties and from the environment. And the point of incarnation is for us to realise our, our own selves, our own individualisation. So in a sense, the child is there saying, who am I, what's going on? And everything, all of these emotions are the way that it starts to learn about itself and its own individual self. So it doesn't really have a defence. In a way, you're telling it everything about itself. And can you see why it doesn't have enough defense because basically everything that's going to come to it from its environment is going to come through you and the person that it has the least defense of is you your parents All right? now your defenses of the environment do affect the child so if you have different areas where you prevent the child from being harmed here then that's going to be great for the child obviously but here remember we're talking about everything emotionally so it's a, the really part of the goal is to help the child in, in terms of protection, is to protect the child from emotional damage from its environment. Now, the time they spend the most, the person they spend the most time with is us, the parents. And so that's where they're going to get the majority of their emotional damage. So if I haven't worked on my emotions and cleared through my emotions as a parent, the child will get the emotional damage. Tomorrow, there'll be a little session that myself and Tristan will do together. <coughs> Tristan's my son. And so he'll be able to tell you a lot of the emotional damage that he felt from my treatment of him. And that will help you see how the child is just absorbing all of this stuff emotionally. And it might not have been my intention, but that's certainly the feelings that he'll be dealing with. And so we'll talk about that tomorrow. Now, the section 1.6 down in the list there, you notice that it talks about the child learning to use its free will and is becoming individualised. The only way the child can gain an awareness of itself is for it to experience life, right? Now, how it experiences life is going to greatly determine what the child feels about itself. And so this is where we need to be very, very careful as parents in what we do with our children. And I don't mean careful here, I mean, we need to feel care in our emotional state towards our child. Does that make sense? Not an intellectual state. So, with that section, the child being the pristine child of God, is there any questions associated with that at all that you've got? Thanks, Tris. How much would a sibling who doesn't want a, another one to take parents' attention, how, how much would that impact on the child? And 
the reason why a sibling doesn't want another child to have attention is because the sibling itself is having an issue with the parents. So even those kind of problems where you've got children, siblings of each other, um, you know, tr treating each other badly is actually because of the parent's emotion. And we'll talk about some of those denied emotions that the parents will be experiencing to create that kind of an event yeah, during the day. Um, That's correct. What you said is exactly correct. And what happens with Asperger's and, and autism type syndromes, the child is very sensitive at the soul level, so sensitive in fact, that all it feels when it's incarnated is just the barrage of unhealed emotions from its environment. And what happens is it starts to not have a sense of self. And the reason why it doesn't have a sense of self is because it's getting so many emotions from its environment that it can't determine who it itself is and who, what's coming from the environment. And so there's a, not a very clear delineation in the child itself as to who it is. So when the parents actually heal emotions, and, and more emotions you heal as a parent, you'll find actually the child will start actually feeling some of its own emotions. And, uh, and you'll find that process will grow fairly rapidly, depending on how rapidly you parents deal with their emotions. The reason why the problem is genetic is because our parents usually have the same emotions that we have um, in terms of shutting down our system. And what's happening at the moment, there are a lot of souls, if you could say children being born, because they're being born into a more sensitive environment, they are becoming more sensitive to the suppression of emotion. And that's really what uh, those kind of problems like autism and Asperger's and so forth are created from. So yes, you can heal your child very quite rapidly actually. Um, and the earlier you do it, the better. So the earlier you work on your own emotions when you've got an autistic child, the better for the child. Yeah. Jen? Thank you. Um, how much impact does the way in which the child was conceived have on the child? So if the child was conceived, say, of rape or um, violence, um, will that have an impact upon the child? Yeah, yeah. It would just um, be impacted by the emotions of the people involved. So it's the same, it's the same principle. But obviously in a situation like that, there's a lot of distress probably on the part of the mother and probably a lot of um, quite dark emotions coming from the father, if, if that is the case with rape. So it would have an impact on that soul. Yeah, so, so if the... If so the male usually who involves himself in rape is it's due to having a feeling of powerlessness with women and so he wants to exercise his power violently. So there will be that kind of emotion projected at the child and the, and the woman will have a lot of different emotions too, not just from the event but prior to the event that would attract the event anyway. And those particular emotions would also uh, impact upon the child. So it would be... But again, all of these can be quite easily healed if we own them all. We'll talk about the effect of denial versus feeling later. So a lot of people feel, and it's just something we'd like to say right now, is a lot of people feel that if you're feeling your emotions, that's when you're damaging someone else. But the reality is, is when you're not feeling your emotions, that's when you're actually being the most damaging. So, for example, a woman who is pregnant from a rape, if she decides, well, I can't cry because I have this child now inside of me growing, it's actually more damaging to her than if she actually lets go of her grief during her pregnancy. It's more damaging to the child as well as to herself. If she is better for her if she lets go of the grief during her pregnancy rather than waiting until the child is born or holding on to it for later. Does that make sense, Dennis? Yes, yeah, so I'll, 
I've recently watched a DVD with uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton, and he actually had a clip on there, uh, an Italian clip, where they were scanning a, a mother carrying a baby. And the mother and father were arguing, and twice the male and the female raised their voice, and the baby actually jumped within the womb. Yep. You could actually see it hitting the top of the womb, it was just so violent. Yep. And these emotions that the baby in the womb is getting, the, the time in the womb is actually the most damaging time for a newly incarnated child. And the reason why is because they are so sensitive to the emotions of both parents um, and what's going on for both parents in that in, while in the womb. Also, the child can't personally develop a connection with God while in the womb unless the mother and father are developing a relationship with God. So there's other issues involved with that, which we'll discuss later as well. So you can actually assist your child, unborn child, to develop a relationship with God while, while it's in the womb. But of course, most people would never think of doing that. Yeah. So the, even receiving divine love for the child, you can pray for the child to receive divine love while, you're in, while it's in the womb, and if it's, as long as it's in harmony with its own emotions, it will receive divine love. And you can also deny it that as well by the mother uh, denying her connection with God. That also denies the child the connection with God while it's in the womb as well. So there's a lot of things that need to be learned about the actual gestation period of pregnancy regarding how it influences the person for the rest of their life. Yeah. Any other questions you'd like to ask? No? It's good. Let's get moving on then. So the next section is about um, the parent's responsibility towards the child. Yeah. The one that I always think of is the first one. My role as a parent is not to parent this child, but to help the child see that, that God is the parent of my child, of the child. And I'm just really the older brother of the child. So the way I see myself with Tristan or Caleb, my two sons at the moment, is I just view myself as their, as their older brother. In the, and only older from the sense that I've been around a bit longer, that's all. And with regard to my daughter from the first century, it's the same feeling I have, like, that I'm just her, their, her older brother. I'm not her father, her father is God. Now, bearing that in mind, that means that I am really going to be a surrogate or a proxy for God. In other words, the way the child's going to see me is very much going to be imposed upon the way the child sees God at some point. Does that make sense to everyone? So, obviously... That tells me a lot about what I need to do in my relationships with my children once I do that. So the endeavour is to treat our children as God would, to allow them to experience life in the way that God would have us experience life. And our responsibility is actually just to teach them about that, to, to um, enlighten them to the, to the processes of the universe. Yeah. So that comes down, we're down to what do we teach them? Well, the first thing to teach them is the principles of love and truth. Particularly truth, because truth always, remember, sets you free. So, so if you can teach the principles of truth to the child, then the child will be set free too. Now, the way we do this is not intellectually, again, it's emotionally. So it's about being truthful emotionally, even with yourself. So when you lie to yourself about your own emotions, what are you teaching your child? You're teaching the child to lie to themselves about their own emotions. Quite simple. So when you are not exactly as you feel, when you are displaying something outwardly that is not what you're feeling inside of yourself, you are actually teaching the child the opposite of what it needs to learn. Does that make sense? It's very important. Love and truth are two qualities we need to teach our children because they're two qualities. Remember, every single discussion we've had, I've always drawn, generally when I've referred to God, there's love on one side and truth on the other. And that's how we need to be with our children, exactly the same way as that, having developing those qualities within ourselves. 
and um, possibly speaking to them about teaching them how they can pray for divine love, how they can develop their relationship with God. Um, yeah. Also, another quality is free will. Like this soul has free, its own free will. Most parents have a lot of trouble when we start talking about this in a practical sense. Because they say, oh, do you... Like, I was talking to someone a few weeks ago. And might have been someone in this audience, I can't remember now. But and they were moving, and they moved to an upper level, and there was a... Oh, that's right, it was someone down at Port Macquarie. And, uh, and the lady was yelling at the child to not fall off the balcony. Right? because it was on a second level apartment and they were just moving in and the child had climbed up on some boxes staring over and you know was peering over the guardrail of the balcony but she was yelling at the child right at the same time so firstly that child has free will it can do whatever it wants secondly you yelling at it has just broken a law of God and projection of anger at the child has just broken a law of God so there must be a better way to handle it, right, than that. And there is, of course, and we'll talk about that a bit later. But can you see how we can quite easily, just because we're afraid of something happening, influence the free will of our child straight away? We often do that in our interaction with our children. And yet, what are we meant to be teaching them? Free will. We're meant to be teaching them how to exercise their free will, and then what do we do? We curb it rather than actually work with it. And that, so that's something later you'll see that's really important in, in this process. So the next point is about teaching of God's laws. So I think that's something that children naturally learn, actually, if they are allowed their free will and taught about love and truth. But I guess as parents, it's something that can be done to assist them, to teach them about some, um, or to perhaps encourage them to observe the laws of God. And we'd like some of them that we know about are the law of attraction, the law of compensation. And so we talk later on about if we start to take away those laws, the consequences of those laws in our children's lives, it's actually quite damaging. What we need to be doing is teaching them about those laws because they're the laws that will govern them forever. So let's say they go and do something at school that's quite damaging to another child and then they get called in front of the teacher and the teacher gives them a blast and then they get called in front of the headmaster and he does a similar thing and then there's a little note coming home and, and all those kind of things happening as a result of them choosing, and we'll talk more lately or later of why they would choose to do it, but if we, if we then step in and get angry with the headmaster and angry with the teacher and so forth, we're not teaching them at all that there is a result, there is results to actions. So can you see how if we don't, even just if they start understanding the law of attraction in their life, it's going to be very, very powerful. Later you'll see what the emotion must be in the parent in that particular instance. Because everything that our child does is a result of an emotion in the parents generally, particularly when they're very young. And... Um, can I just talk too about the protection of the child? Um, a lot of times, you know, we think we can physically protect our children. The truth is that the only way you can protect your child is by your soul protection that you afford the child. And what I mean by that is, you have a certain law of attraction, right? So let's say you have an emotion in you of feeling unworthy. Let's say that's emotion inside of you. What will happen is that Emotion will drive a law of attraction where you will be treated unworthily by people outside of you. Does that make sense? In order to trigger this emotion inside of you. Now, if you have that emotion inside of you, there's a high likelihood your child will have the same emotion inside of them. Particularly if you have that emotion inside of you while you know, they're in the womb or whatever and absorbing these emotions. So, when just the, just the fact of you having the emotion has, has stopped them from being protected. Does that make sense? Just you having the emotion. The instant you choose to not have the emotion, the instant you choose to actually feel it and release it and let it go, that's the instant they will no longer have that same law of attraction. So you can see how you, their lives will change greatly when you change your own emotion. That's the key thing, one key thing to understand. So in this section of the responsibility you have towards the child, is there any questions you'd like to ask about that? The kind of responsibility you have towards the children? Mr. 
I'd like to just give an example that happened in my household this week. Uh, I live with my daughter and three grandchildren, so I'm very aware of the three generations and what's going on emotionally. Uh, we had some problems with our landlord, which upset me a lot. I chose to work with my emotions, write things down. My daughter got angry to a certain degree, but stuffed a lot of her emotions down. And the next morning, she had a um, little altercation with her eldest, which is seven-year-old Eden, before he went to school, which wasn't really anything more than what would normally happen. Why don't you have your shoes on yet? But he started to cry. And she said, what are you crying about? And I thought, it's because you haven't dealt with the emotions from what happened yesterday. He's dealing them for you. And I wrote it all down. I want to share it with her. I haven't had a chance yet. It needs to have the right time and space to do it. But it was just so blatantly obvious. Yeah. And you'll find, uh, as you work through different things as a parent, you'll find that you'll see a direct link. I've had times when I'm sitting down with a parent, which I'll talk about later in more detail, where every single emotion the parent that I could feel from the parent that the parent was denying, right at that instant, the child was acting out the emotion they were denying. And the instant they actually even acknowledged intellectually that they had that emotion within them, the child straight away stopped acting out the actual emotion. And it's just so instant like that. And it's very important to understand that when it comes to your relationship with your children. Yeah. And Jen? So if I'm committed to change, but my ex-husband has not ever heard of even natural love or divine love or even the teachings, does that then limit how much progress my children can make? What I'm asking is, is you know, um, I'm committed and want change in order to help my children, mm -hmm. in order to help myself. Um, but what happens about the parent who doesn't find the way of this with where there's a separation? Well, yes, it does make it more difficult for the child if one parent does not want to deal with their emotions. However, it's not impossible, because when you think about it, for most of you here, your parents don't want to deal with their emotion, and yet you're here dealing with yours. So it's still possible to deal with your emotions. Does that make sense? But it does make it more difficult. And the reason why is there is an emotional link between the parent and the child with every unhealed emotion. And so um, that link would have to be broken. And it's much better if the link can be broken by the parent, by the parent experiencing their own emotion, rather than forcing the child to break that link. So that puts a lot of pressure on the child. Dennis? Thank you. I, this is a, an experience I, um, when I, when I left my marriage, <coughs> my, and my oldest son, who was 20 now, actually, um, he'd already partly left home for work. But my relationship with, with him was really bad. Um, but since I've been dealing with my emotions, my ex-wife, she just thinks I lost the plot. But, yeah. but I'm dealing with my emotions, and now I've got a relationship with my son that we're almost friends. Yeah. And it really does make a lot of difference. Yeah, exactly. You can, so this will happen with adult children as well as with young children. All of these principles are the same. Obviously, with an adult child, there's more self-responsibility than there is with a young child. Most of the young child's emotions are a reflection of your own. Does that make sense? Can you elaborate on what you mean by the child breaking the link with the parent? And every single unhealed emotion that has entered the child from the parent creates a codependent link between the parent and the child. Do you understand that? Like, there is a codependent link between the parent and the child for every unhealed emotion in the parent. The child will respond in a codependent way to the parent's unhealed emotion. So what that means then is if the parent gets rid of the codependence themselves, then the child, the link between them and the child in that particular codependence is, is broken straight away. But if the parent doesn't do it, then it's up to the child to break that link if they want to have a free life. And that becomes quite difficult, and usually with a lot of opposition from their parents. 
So the key is, as parents, if we're talking about parenting children, we want to actually be the ones who take all the steps to get rid of these emotions within us that create codependence to us by our children. Does that make sense? Like, you can see there's a link. If, if we draw it uh, from a from a person point of view. So, AJ, maybe if we give an example of what a codependence is, emotion might be, yeah. so the definition of love. So here, here's the parent. Uh, here's the child. This parent believes that love is service. Right? Let's say. Because that belief, that belief then enters the child, the child now believes love is service. And when I say service, it means doing everything for everyone else and nothing for myself. Right? So let's say what's happening is the parent lives a life where they do everything for everyone else all the time and they do very, very little for themselves. The child now has that same belief in them, that love is service, right? But it will often feel very, very hard on the child. The child will often also feel anger about that because it doesn't feel like a belief that suits them, but they feel impelled to have it because of the parent's emotion. So the parent's emotion is impressed upon the child. There's a link now between the two of them. This child is now going to feel that it needs to serve its parent in order to love it. Does that make sense? To receive love, yes, it has to first serve. Does that make sense? It has to first serve the parent in order to be loved by the parent. Now that's a codependent link. You follow me? Now, it's great if the parent can break that. If the parent can actually let go of the emotion where they believe that love is that, what will happen is the child will automatically feel free to just give the parent things based on what it wants to give the parent rather than feeling that it has to. But if the parent doesn't do that, then the only way the child's going to deal with this emotion is to stop serving the parent. Now, you imagine if the parent's used to being served by the child, and all of a sudden, the child stops serving the parent. What does the parent go through? You don't love me anymore, you know. What's happened? What's happened to my children? You know, you get a lot of projections usually coming from the parent back to the child. So that, so that the child starts serving them again. So can you see how the parent's emotions are determining the linkages and this codependent link gets set up? And, and if that codependent link it remains, the child is going to be affected the rest of its life with that link, no matter how old it is. It's going to be 50, and you might be 70, and it still will feel that it's going to serve you. And that's what love is. Does that make sense? The truth is that's not what love is. Love wouldn't project that at the child, but often we have these emotions unhealed within us as parents that make us believe it is that which then cause the child to believe it. And if the child and the parent don't have interactions with each other, there are linkages that are still between the child and the parent. The reason why is the child is now feeling emotions of loss about the parent not being with them. Do you follow me? And so there are emotions still that are being built up in the child through that. Now, the parent who is with the child can help them deal with a lot of that emotionally and actually release it for good. But, but remember, your soul transmits emotion wherever it is in the world. So you might have a child right now with you and the parent the, part, the ex partner might be on the other side of the earth, but it still has an emotional linkage with the child. And the child is still feeling it to a lesser degree than the one that, that's right near it, obviously. And if you have a partner who's treating the child lovingly, obviously it'll be even to a lesser degree. But there is still a feeling that is going to be coming from the other person until the child breaks that link now. It's highly unlikely the ex-parent, the ex-parent, I'd like to call them, because they're not acting like a parent, and is going to break that linkage. So unfortunately, they're forcing the child into breaking that linkage. And this is where the parent with them can help them break them to actually work through the issue emotionally. But we'll talk about some of that later. Anyone else?
Someone else had a question? Yes. Next question. Uh, my question is about um, step parents, um, what role they play and how much influence they have. And do you want to answer? Or? No? Um, and step parent uh, obviously wasn't involved in the creation process, if you like, of the child. So therefore, there's a, the step parent um, doesn't have as much influence during, usually during the gestation period or the pregnancy of the child. The step parent usually comes along later in life, you know, like when the child's two, three, four, or even older. Now, that parent obviously still has a role because they are in a relationship with their mother or father, with the child's mother or father, their real, their, their actual parent. That being, in, that bear being born in mind, they obviously have compatible emotions, which means they probably have compatible emotional injuries. Now, because of that, there is going to be definitely an effect that the step parent has on the child emotionally. But again, if the parent, step parent takes the same view, I will deal with my emotions, I'll own my emotions, then obviously that affects the child very positively. Yeah. So it just depends on whether the step parent is going to deal with their own emotions or not in the end. Yeah. All right, let's uh, proceed to the next bit. The parent's responsibility towards themselves. Don't give the vital point. Because since um, all of the interactions, since we know now that all of the interactions we have as parents to children are on a soul to soul level, they're emotional. Um, if parents aren't observing their own responsibility to themselves and their relationship with God and their emotions, then essentially they're teaching their child just through, the, through their emotions. So if you don't understand your own free will, for example, then then how is your child going to understand what free will is? Also, you need to remember in each interaction that you do have free will. The parent needs to learn and understand this. Because quite often I see when we start talking about this stuff with children, I've had some children sort of in the teenage years say, well, mum and dad, you've caused all of our problems. You know, We've got all these emotional injuries because of you. Now you've got to buy me an ice cream when I go down there, you know, like using it as bribery. And, and I've seen some of those children actually go down the, road, down the ice cream, you know, buying all these things in the supermarket and throwing it in the trolley and expecting the mother to pay for it. Now, the mother has free will too, so she can actually take out the items out of the trolley <laughs> at, the, at the front desk and say, I'm not paying for those, my daughter is. And, oh, you don't have any money. Oh, okay. Well, it looks like we're not buying that. Because <laughs> your mother, the mother has free will as well, right? You see, often what happens is that anger, anger projected at a child for doing something comes from the parent feeling like they can't, they can't exercise their own free will in the situation. So as parents, it's very important to understand you can exercise your free will. It's not loving to do it angrily, but it is loving to do it. So for another example I would give is like, um, I knew a, a family who the boys just left their clothes strewn all over the house. And the mother was constantly having arguments with them, put away your clothes, put away your clothes, you know. I'm not washing your clothes. And she'd get quite angry with them, you know. And, and then she, because she's sick and tired of her house being dirty, she'd go around in a whirlwind and pick up all their clothes and dump it on their floor. And, and that didn't fix anything either because next week they still <laughs> strewed around all their clothes again and, and it just kept on happening and happening and happening and she just kept on getting more and more angry. But she has free will. She doesn't, she, she doesn't think she has free will in that situation. So what, what she could actually do, and these were adult boys, what she could actually do is gather all the clothes and just take it down the second hand store. <laughs> No? and give them to the second hand store and just say to them, can you keep them there for a week? Can you put a price on all of them? Keep them there for a week and I'll tell my boys where to find them and what the price is and you will have the price of them, right? And just leave them there like that. No? And wait, and when the boys say, where's my clothes, mum? Oh, uh, well, they're not here anymore. <laughs> where are they gone? Oh, well, you didn't put them away, so I took them down to the second hand store. <laughs> You mustn't want them anymore, you know? And just allow the child now to work through the issue. You don't have to be angry about it. 
Do you? In fact, if you're angry about it, you're not being loving about it anyway. Yeah. But go around and just picking things up and, you know, martyr, in a martyrdom sort of a way, it's not really loving either. So. Okay. So the key thing is to, every one of these things would be just to, te to teach the truth of them. So what, what, in that case, we'd want to teach the child self-responsibility, right? Which we'll look at a bit later in our sessions. But, you know, that's one way we could do it. But if we, as soon as we do it with anger or rage or, you know, any of those feelings, straight away we're out of harmony anyway, aren't we? With love. So we'd need to address that emotion within us first before we did it. But we can easily do it. And, and the lady actually said in this discussion that I had with her, she said, well, would you tell them first that you're going to do that? And I said, no. And the reason why is because, you know, usually as parents, we've already taught, told them, can you please pick up the stuff a hundred times before? Usually, that's the case, isn't it? And the reason why they're not acting is because they don't think we will act. Does that make sense? So in other words, they're not respecting our free will to act. And I'm allowed to act as a parent independent of what my child wants, right? If it's in harmony with love. And that situation would be. Does that make sense? So there's plenty of things we can do just to, to use our free will. Now, as it turned out in that discussion, that, that person I was discussing that principle with said, I could never do that. That's really cruel. <laughs> So what was influencing her free will was this belief that she would be a bad mother if she did that. Does that make sense? And she didn't want to deal with that emotion. So she would rather pick up after her, her children, her male children, every single time, rather than deal with that emotion that she was a bad mum. The truth is that she was teaching her children a very important principle, and that is I can use my mum whenever I want to do whatever I want. And not only that, she was teaching them because they were boys that they can treat women this way. So there's some really, really large principles she was teaching them, but she thought it would be cruel to do anything different because of the avoidance of her own emotion. So can you see how free will, the parent's free will, is very important? All right, then. Let me show <laughs> So the parent cannot love them love the child if they're actually sacrificing themselves. Um, fairly important, I think. Yeah. Can you, how many times has that happened? Like, uh, the mother, for example, cooks a meal for her children, but she doesn't want to. How many times do you do that, mums? Cook a meal for your children, but you don't actually want to cook the meal. Right? Can you see that just that act is not loving? You'd be, it'd be more loving to not cook the meal. Because actually what you're doing when you're cooking a meal when you don't feel like cooking a meal is you're actually entering a lie state within yourself. Right? The more loving thing would be to work out why you don't want to cook the meal and let yourself feel about that. And it might be that you've done 20,000 of them before and you'd like one cooked for you. And there's some pretty big emotions associated with that, right? So again, feel that. But don't sacrifice yourself for the sake of your child. Now, I'm not, we're, we're talking about sacrifice in lots of different areas here, not just in the simple areas that I've just mentioned. So we'll get into the nitty gritties of that a bit later as well. The, the point is, I think we've all got ourselves into this whole big cycle of obligation, where as a mother I should do this, or as a father, or, and, and actually the actions perhaps that are involved, like cooking the meal, can come from a loving place, but when we're actually feeling the obligation, we're not in the loving place. So we're far better to not actually take the action and feel the emotion so that one day we'll get to the loving place. Yeah. But while we stay in the obligation, we're not helping anyone. Yeah. So we'll questions about this a bit in the end of the session, in the end of this section. The other one I've got there, notice 3.3, .3, the parent cannot sacrifice their relation with God, relationship with God for the child. Now, often your children will want you to lie for them. Often your children will want you to do things for them which would actually be breaking one of God's laws. Now, if you decide you're going to do that, then you are actually sacrificing your relationship with God, which is actually, remember I've been saying that should be your primary relationship you have in the, in the universe, and you're sacrificing that relationship 
for a relationship with your child. And why, why might we do that, Adrian? Well, there might be quite a lot of emotions involved with that, right? Uh, for example, I may have just an emotion that I, that I don't want to feel, which is like, I want to have the approval of my child. And so I'll do anything for my child, including breaking God's laws for my child. That's just one example. Yeah, or fear. What will happen if I don't do this for my child? Yeah. So, for example, like, um, your child may not want to go to school, for example. And so you may decide, in harmony with the laws of free will, that you're not going to send your child to school anymore. Right? Which means you're going to get a letter probably from the school saying that you're being a bad mother or a bad father or whatever and, you know, this is illegal and all those kind of things, right? And, uh, and then you may decide, well, uh, well, I'll try and force the child to go to school. So rather than forcing them physically, you may then decide to do it with a reward-based system. So if they go to school, you'll do this for them, or if you go to school, you'll do that for them. Now what you're doing is breaking the law of God then, because you're, you're actually prostituting yourself in order to get somebody else to do something. Does that make sense? And it's very dangerous and damaging to the child. It's much better they don't go to school and you face up with the issues about that. And honestly, if everybody did that, you know, we'd have a far different inter education system than we've got today, if everybody did it. But of course, very few people want to because we, we, we create these organisations called, you know, like the education system, which we then think have a mind of their own. And then we start doing everything for them. But a lot of times they're not harmonious with divine love in the way that they're operating. So I'm not saying don't send the child to school. What I'm saying is ask yourself why they don't want to go. Let yourself feel the emotion inside of that. Because there's something inside of you is the reason why they don't want to go. It's very important to understand that. When you want something, does God just say, oh, no worries, here it is, bang. Well, actually, God does do that. <laughs> so most, but most of you don't feel that. Why don't you feel that? Because there's emotions that prevent you from truly asking for a start. But God actually gives everything based on desire. And it has to be pure desire. Right? Now, often what happens with us is that we, we, we don't have pure desires. And so, therefore, when we ask for something... We don't actually get it exactly as we wanted it. When you are in a state where you're at one with God, you'll find that you'll actually ask for something. And because you're in one with God, you'll automatically be asking for something harmonious with love. And because of that, you'll automatically get it straight away, exactly as you wanted it. Now, we need to teach our child that same principle. So how do we go about teaching our child that principle? Let's say a child wants a dog. <coughs> A lot of people say, you hear them say, oh, I bought my child a dog, they really wanted the dog, but they don't look after the dog, I have to look after it. Did the child really want the dog? No. So what do we do as parents? We need to allow them to build their desire, to really build their desire. The way, one way we can do that is remember, we're not their parent either, God is. So what we could do is start doing what we do with God when it comes to exercising our desires. Build our desire, Talk to God about what we want, what we feel we need in our lives, and exercise a desire for it. That's, what, that's how we get it. So let's do that. Let's encourage our child to do that. So let's say a child wants a dog. So sit down with the child. Show it how to pray for a dog. Right? What else does the child need to do? Learn, learn how to care for the dog. So, so what you do is sit down with the child and show it how to find out how to care for a dog. And then ask the child questions like, Are you, do you want to do that? Do you want to care for a dog? Remember, it's every day, walking every day, feeding them every day. And the, the dog, dog's going to maybe live for 15 years, 20 years. Do you want to do that for the next 15 or 20 years? Is that really what you want? Yeah, you know. So let them develop that desire. When they have a really complete desire, then... In fact, it's very powerful if then you actually allow the law of attraction to bring them their dog. So in other words, you not even buy it. You actually allow the law of attraction 
to bring them their dog. And not only, that will teach them so many things. It will teach them firstly that they have complete control over what they get through their desire. Secondly, it will teach them that you don't have to supply any of their needs, that God is already doing all of that, even the things they want. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of good things that that will teach them if you allow them to work through the issue that way. But if you just go out and buy the dog, the instant they have a feeling for one, without them building a desire, a sincere desire for it, what's going to happen? They'll learn that they can just get whatever they want, whenever they want it. And how many of you then later have regretted that? <laughs> and says, parents, I know I have. Right? So often we teach them the wrong thing when it comes to desire as well. So mirror God's treatment of you. So if God treats you a certain way, you treat your children in, a very, in the same way. You want to teach them how to interact with God. How might we teach them about the law of compensation? Um, the law of compensation issue, for example, might be um, like we have we have dealt with an emotion that causes us to be violent towards somebody. So we've dealt with the emotions as a parent. We've released all of those emotions, and now and we've talked to our child, and our child understands the principles of violence and all those kind of things that inside the child. But the child goes to school and gets bullied by someone. And instead, of just, and instead of just dealing with it through their emotions, they decide to snot him in the nose. So they punch the guy in the nose. So then they come home with a note from maybe the school, so giving them a three-day suspension or something like that about the whole issue, and quite upset. Now, as a parent, we need to actually allow them to work through the law of compensation on the issue. They've actually done something disharmonious with love. There is going to be an effect on that. Now, if you take away that effect as a parent, without them being repentant for what they've done, what you're going to do is enable them to do it again. And this applies to so many things in your relationships with the children. If you actually help them get away with an event they've created, you are actually helping them do it again, and you're helping them to worsen their own soul condition. Now, God wouldn't do that. God doesn't do that with you. So if you do that with your child, you're actually breaking the law of love of God in that transaction. Does that make sense? Okay, so questions about this section? Any questions? Dennis, you have one? <coughs> you can't remember? No. <laughs> Just an observation with you. When you were to use the example of, of not wanting to cook, it would also affect that food itself. It just wouldn't taste as good and it wouldn't be as nourishing. Yes, how many of you have seen the water stuff with, uh, what's the fellow's name? Emoto. Emoto. You've seen that? How just the projection of love changes the substance. Well, that happens with food as well, obviously. Food is what, particularly if it's fruit and vegetables, it's 90 or 90 percent plus water, right? So naturally the same projections affect the food. So even you having these projections of like anger while you're cooking are going to affect the food that you're actually giving everyone to eat. So you know, just basic things like that are quite obvious when you think about it. Uh, I've got a lot of patterns for my parents. So I tried to make my kids perfect and gave them a lot of rules and regulations. But as adults, they're now 33 and 31, but probably 10 years ago, we were talking about um, my parenting. And one of the things they said to me was, Mum, we knew how to get around you because if we pushed hard enough, we knew we could get those boundaries pulled down. The one thing you didn't do was you didn't stick to what you said you were going to do. And they read me like a book, which made it even harder. Yeah, it's a big issue of having your yes mean yes and your no, no. Now, most of us don't do that because of emotional reasons within ourselves. So making, making threats as parents is a very damaging thing to do for a start. Um, usually based on some very unhealed emotions within ourselves, but making a threat and not carrying it through <laughs> is even more damaging. 
because it teaches them that uh, you, you have actually, you don't mean anything that you say. And this is why the majority of parents find it very difficult t talking to their children because most of the time the children already know that you don't mean anything you're saying. They know they can get away with it anyway. But how many of you have asked your children to pick up after themselves in the house? Right? How many of you have children that do that every single time without being asked again? Right? Not many people? Okay, a few do. But can you see, there must be a reason why. And you know what the reason why is? They think you're not serious. It's quite simple. Right? The deeper reason why is that they don't have enough self-love to do it. Do you follow me? Because if you love yourself, you will always care for your environment. So the deeper reason inside of them is they don't have enough self-love to actually care for their environment. But where do you think they got their lack of self-love from? Mm -hmm. right? So there's something that that's telling me straight away. I haven't given my child enough self-love for them to actually tidy up after their environment. And you see this happen a lot, right? When a child is militantly brought up to care for its environment, so its room is pristine, you know, they're given a clip over the ear when, when it's not pristine, and they learn the pain associated with it not being pristine, so they keep it pristine. The instant they leave home and they get their own flat, how tidy is their flat? It's usually a total mess and a total big stuff. And the reason why is because they haven't learned the reason why, in here, the emotional reason why keeping your environment is good. Uh, keeping the environment clean is good. They haven't learned the emotional reason that actually there is a connection with God that grows due to cleanliness. You know, God always has things that clean up environments. God doesn't create anything but pristine environments, right? And if we want to be one with God, we're going to have to learn to do the same at some point. Now, now they haven't learned that, obviously. So who taught them that? Me? I taught them that. And so can you see how every single thing that we're teaching our child is just a message about God in the end and also their relationship with themselves? Can you see that? Okay. One of the biggest hurdles I'm finding at the moment is because I had a problem with the word God, yeah. I don't now, but a lot of people around the world have a problem with the word God and just bringing it up inside a family that hasn't been brought up to go to church all the time and everything is a big issue in itself. So for me to go home and say to my kids, well, okay, now I'm going to um, talk about God a lot, they're going to run. You know, so how do you get around that? Well, again, there's an emotion in them that is a reflection of your own emotion. So um, firstly, if you're worried about speaking about God, there's still an emotion within you that's unhealed about God. Does that make sense? Otherwise, you wouldn't be worried about it. Secondly, there is a law of compensation issue involved there. You're now going through the pain of actually, that you've, you've created in your own environment, actually, that when you were against the idea of God, now you're for the idea or concept of God, but but you're taught, you have taught your children to be against the idea of God. Does that make sense? And there's a law of compensation effect on that. There's a law of compensation effect on that. So allow yourself to feel those emotions. Allow yourself to feel the fact that, yes, you know, I have created this. And allow yourself to feel and release that emotion. When you do, your children will have a lot less uh, resistance to the concept of God. As soon as you release the emotion of the law of compensation, which is that I taught them to di to distance themselves from God. Well, that also helps the social environment around them because, you know, socially out there, there's a lot of people who don't like it because of the religious aspect. Uh, certain, so the question is, would that help it from a social aspect? Because there's many people who don't like the religious aspect of God. Certainly, if they have a concept of God now in their heart, that's non-religious, and it's just father-to-child concept of God, which is all that we're teaching here, right? Father-to-child, mother-to-child concept of God. If they have that concept within them, they won't attract religious zealots or, or, or people who are anti those kind of teachings if they have that concept. 
It's only when they have concepts that are disharmonious with that concept, disharmonious with love, in other words, that they'll start attracting people. If they have an emotion within themselves that they can't speak of God because they're afraid of people, then certainly they're going to attract people attacking them because they're afraid of speaking about God. Does that make sense? And, and until they deal with that emotion. But you can help them through all of that. It's just an illustration of the law of attraction. So allow, again, yourself to firstly display that attitude in the family and feel it inside of yourself and feel the moments when you're not actually allowing yourself, do you know what I mean? Allowing yourself to connect to God because you're worried about what your children are going to think. When you do that, their whole attitude will change because it's all your law of attraction. Yeah. And, oh, sorry, it's here and then Jen. Nothing. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Just got that from blowing away. Thank you. Um, our eldest son has gone down, snuck out and gone down the park. And he doesn't want to listen to this discussion, it's boring, right? And uh, the reason why it's boring is there's no action. And the reason why there's no action is because, uh, like, I'm not too entertaining. <laughs> he, the issue really is to do with what's going on for yourself. How do you feel about him going? I'm just somebody might take him away. Sorry, if you can hold it a bit closer for me. I'm just saying that somebody might take him away. Oh, OK. So you're worried that somebody might grab him and take him away. OK. So that's what you need to feel. When you feel that emotion, you might find that it might attract them back into the audience. Does that make sense? Allow yourself to feel that. We'll talk more about that as it goes. Now, can you see? You can't. And that's one of the reasons why you're feeling that emotion. And that's a fairly big emotion for many parents, isn't it? How many of you are really, really concerned for the safety and welfare of your child? Quite a few. All right, so big emotion. That that. You need to allow yourself to feel that, right? Because if you don't feel that, sooner or later you're going to create a quite intense event where that may occur. So you need to allow yourself to feel it now. So if you feel that, release it. Cry about it, release it. Your children are safe, remember, because of your soul condition. So if you know that your soul condition isn't good enough to save them, then start praying to God about that. Does that make sense? Talk to God about giving our child extra protection. Yeah. Talk to God about giving our child extra protection while I'm dealing with this emotion. Does that make sense? And so there's many times where we can't clear the emotion immediately as a parent. But we can, we can deal with a lot of the emotion. But we can also pray for God's protection of the child while we're dealing with the emotion. And God actually assigns celestial spirits to do that when we pray for that to occur. Thank you. As a parent, I could um, work my free will and I could just go and stand over there so that I knew I could see him without actually interrupting with what he wanted to do. You've actually still, broken. I'm still breaking my still emotional. Breaking. Yeah. yeah, because what you're doing is you're avoiding your own emotion about it. By actually going and making sure that they're safe, you're actually now at that point avoiding your own emotion. And in fact, what you're doing is not dealing with the causal emotion of why he's out there triggering you in the first place. Does that make sense? So deal with the emotion. Like really focus on dealing with the emotion in every single interaction with your children. Because that changes it straight away. I can, later on I'll be giving you lots of examples where I've done this with parents while I've been in the car with them and all sorts of things. And you'll see, you'll see how it works. The key is to trust that. And you can pray for the protection of the child while you're dealing with this emotion. So you can long to God to protect the child. I need to just deal with this emotion and go into the emotion. Yeah. Jim? I have a question about kindness and nurture and encouragement. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to be an over nurturer mm -hmm. in my relationship with both of my boys. Mm -hmm. um, what comes to mind is an example of 
bringing Rob into the house, um, and Nicholas, my younger son. At the time he didn't have, I thought, the capacity to understand what it would be like to look after a little dog. So we openly talked about it as you recommended. And he didn't, he didn't know, he didn't have the experience to be able to answer as to whether he wanted a dog or not. And love was a big issue in our household for the three of us. So we got the little dog. My intention and hope was that he would grow in desire for the little dog mm -hmm. and learn to love from it. And that's in fact what happened. But in the beginning, the little dog, um, I really looked after the little dog until Nicholas grew in his capacity to be able to take charge. So my question is really about um, kindness and does talking really help? Isn't it a matter of raising them in experience? Providing opportunities for experience? True, but um, let's look at talking. Does talking really help? Talking helps as long as your emotion is in harmony with what you're saying. Right? Talking doesn't help if your emotion is completely different to what you're saying. Can you see the relationship? If your emotion is in harmony with your speech, and your emotion is in harmony with your action, then talking and acting is perfectly fine. It's when your emotion is not in harmony with your speech or your action that, that, that uh, talking is pointless. So, example with a dog, getting a dog, for example. If I have a desire in myself to get a dog, then I own up to that and just get a dog for yourself, which is really what you've finished up doing, to be truthful. Now, he certainly learned something from that interaction by you demonstrating love to the dog and so forth and him spending time with the dog. That's fine, yeah. But initially you got the dog for yourself, really. Does that make sense? Yeah, but... Certainly for yourself. It's the thing you're not owning up for is that it's for yourself. You, don't, you want to feel right now that it was for your child. But, but it wasn't yet for your child, it was for yourself. Now, it was for yourself because you felt your child needed to learn something about love, and there was feelings in you right at that moment about, um, you know, how do I teach them about love? Because you didn't feel experienced enough within yourself to teach them about love. And that was the emotion driving the dog coming into the family. Now, it's not harmful, but just say it, it was for you, you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Just own up to that and then go deeper into, the, into it emotionally, then obviously you did interact with the dog in a loving way, which helped your son also interact with the dog in a loving way, and it certainly did teach your son, son some things. So there's no harm in that. But we need to also make sure that we're owning up to what we actually did it for. Because often as children we said, we finish up saying, sorry, as adults, we finish up saying to our children, I did this for you, don't you understand? Does the child feel like you did it for them? Then they don't understand. Because <laughs> if they don't, feel, they don't feel the same as you do about the issue, then obviously they feel completely different. And they're not going to understand that you have done it for them. And in fact, if, they, if you feel that way, you haven't done it for them. Even if you feel that way, I did this for my child, you actually haven't done it for your child. You've done that for yourself. There's an emotion in yourself that you're actually starving or calming down. Does that make sense? Because when you do it in love, you will not keep account of it. You will not say, I did this for you, so you're going to do this for me. Or you won't say any of those kind of words anymore because you won't feel them anymore. Does that make sense to everyone? Look at what's going on inside of yourself as parents. And then Karen, please. Um, I've had lots of times when I was, when my kids were little, when I felt very comfortable with them being a distance away from me. Um, but I've had, a, I think I've had a lot of times where other adults have really been very angry with me for doing it and that's made me feel terrible. Yep. Um, so I don't know what the issue is. Well the issue is that 
what you will do to please others. So that's the issue that's being right or triggered in you. You're right in, in being comfortable with your children being with others, other people. In the end, of course, you want to maximise their free will. You want to help them do whatever they want to do. Yeah. Just them going along mostly in the shop or yeah, there's nothing, the local pool. Something. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Except the projection, the, the projection from another adult to you as being a bad mum, and that's what you respond to. Does that make sense? So it's an emotion in yourself. And in fact, they will trigger that emotion just by their action. So my emotion is that I'm a bad mum? The emotion was about um, other people thinking you're a bad mum. It's not about you actually feeling you're a bad mum. It's that it is you're worried about what other people think of you. Does that make sense? Yep. With regard to how you treat the children. Yeah. Parents of parents often have a lot of projections, don't they? Parents. Of grandparents often have a lot of projection onto parents about the way they should be parenting. Yeah, how many, how many of you have that? That, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that often relates back to the actual parent, the parent-child relationship that existed when the parent was a child. Yeah. That's correct, yeah. So if your parent is telling you how to parent your own children, and you're upset about that in some way, there is still something going on between you and your parent in terms of an unhealed emotion. That's, that's what, why that's very attractive. The next section is a really important section. Um, you want to start mentioning some of it, Mary, while I draw some more? Sure. So it's section four up to, and it's the damage of parents' denial of personal emotions to the child. Um, and this is a favourite subject of AJ's. And having travelled with him and children, I have uh, witnessed a lot of um, a lot of this kind of stuff firsthand. Where really, when a parent suppresses their emotion, that the child immediately starts to reflect it. So I think it happens in a lot of subtle, perhaps it gets more subtle as the child gets older, but certainly when the child is very small, it's, it's quite um, evident. Yeah. So let's look at that. Every single emotion denied by the parent will be felt and experienced in full by the child. Now you think of the number of emotions that you're denying right at the moment. Uh, for, all, for many of us, it's like 50 of them right at the moment, one moment, you know. And every single one of those emotions your child is experiencing in full, right at that moment. It's a scary proposition, isn't it, when you think about it, what's actually passing through the child. Now, the reason why is this. Here's your soul. You can think of your emotions. Your emotions are energy in motion. Does that make sense? Emotions. E for energy in motion. Energy in motion is your emotions. Now, when you stop the energy from being in motion, in other words, you prevent the emotion, what's happening at that point, instead of the emotion passing through you, which is where it, meant, where it has to pass for you to own it, it gets reflected out like a great big antenna to the universe. So let's say, let's say I have some anger in me and I don't allow myself to feel my anger. I suppress my anger by telling myself that I'm not really angry. So let's say I'm doing that. Right at that moment, that anger is being reflected to the universe to the biggest possible extent that it could be coming from us because I'm not actually owning it and feeling it myself. That means that every single person around us will feel that anger. Now let's say for a moment that I'm a mother, so this soul is a mother soul, and my child happens to be a son, and this anger that I have is with men. What do you think my son is going to be feeling? He's going to be feeling constantly that his mother is always angry with him. Does that make sense? Until mum 
owns that emotion. Until she actually feels the emotion pass through her and actually owns it, the sun, and of course every other male in the universe, but the sun is the most sensitive, right? He's the most sensitive soul, he's just a little soul. So he's going to be the most sensitive male towards this anger getting passed around. Can you see what's going on there? That is the result of the parent's denial of this emotion that needs to flow through her. She's now, it's now projected out to the universe and the most sensitive soul in her nearest vicinity is going to be her son, if she has one. And he is going to experience this anger. He's going to feel it. Now, he might be just born. He might be not even able to verbalise the fact don't even know what's really going on. He's just going to feel mum's anger with men. And so can you see why he might be crying the moment he's born? Screaming his head off, in fact. Can you see it straight away? There's these emotions in him that he's trying to let go of, acting out. He's just afraid in many cases. Now, what he will probably try to do then during his life is he'll learn that actually... If I give my mum all of my attention and time, she feels less anger with me. Does that make sense? So what's now happening is it's set up this codependency, this codependency between the mother and the child. She's angry with men and he's realised that the only way for him to lessen her anger with men is for him, because he's a male child, give, to give her something that calms her down that makes her feel less angry with men. So this child will most likely grow up being a very, very conciliatory male towards women. And he will let women just run over the top of him. And imagine throughout his relationships what will happen there. One after the other, he'll just let women dominate him. And all they need to do is project a little bit of anger at him and he's straight into that mode of calming everything down, making everything nice. Can you see that? Just, that? just that one emotion projected at the sun. Now, if the mum lets this emotion pass through her, she will find underneath the anger with men, there's a lot of sadness with men, right? She will actually have herself a good, some good cries and part, let that emotion pass through. When that happens, there's none of this emotion getting projected at her son. In fact, there'll be another emotion of I love men right? getting passed to her son. Now what do you think the son's going to feel? He's going to feel loved no matter where he is. He's going to be feel loved by a woman wherever he is and wherever he goes. That's going to be pretty powerful, don't you think, in terms of his relationships with other people? If it's a real love, not a love based on need. Can you see just, just owning an emotion what it does? Can you see what denying emotion does? Now, the biggest issue is denial of emotion in your life. That's the biggest thing that affects your children. The next biggest thing is when you deny them the experience of that emotion. So they immediately feel it when you're not expressing it. And then often they want to act that out. And then often parents say, stop being loud, stop being naughty. And, and shut down all that emotion that they're just trying to express that they're picking up from their environment. So to give you an example of that, let's say the mum is angry with men and she doesn't want to give love to men. So in other words, if you're angry with someone, it's very hard to want to love them, isn't it? So she doesn't want to love a man. So, so no love goes towards... She doesn't want to love a man. So even though she's caring for her newborn baby who's a male baby, the feeling coming from the mother to the child is, I don't really love you. That's the feeling the child is feeling. You follow me? It's based on the feelings she's feeling. Now, she can deal with that feeling and, and you know, it'll be a totally different situation. But until she deals with this feeling, this child is going to do one of two things based on its personality. One thing is that it it'll feel unloved. And so it may actually then react in anger to the mother. Do you follow me? Getting angry with mum because she doesn't love me 
he doesn't know why, it feels unjust, she, he's not loved and she doesn't, he doesn't understand the, the causes. Now, the other thing he might do is try now to earn her love. So he does things for mummy. So he's not feeling love from mummy, so he goes up and gives mummy a hug all the time. So a lot of times as parents we say, oh, it's lovely, our child always comes up and gives me a hug all the time. Every day that happens, they love me so much, isn't it wonderful? In reality, the child is actually feeling quite insecure and feels like mummy feels unloved and I've got to love her. Because most of the time the child is not allowed to be experiencing its own emotion, it's actually feeling your emotion and responding to your emotion. And you can test it easily. All you need to do at that moment that you feel these things happening is put it into test and, so, and, and do something like, do I feel unloved? Yes, let's own that. Let's notice what happens to my child without me saying anything to them. And you'll find things will change quite rapidly between what's happening in the child. I'll give you an example. I was overseas with a, with a she was a single mum with a daughter who was, um, I think she was eight years of age at the time. And the mum started explaining to me, this was at the breakfast table, mum started explaining to me um, an emotion she felt with her father. She said that the very last time she felt it, she saw her father was just before her father died. She lived, he lived in another town in England. She travelled up to see him in the, and he was in the hospital. And she sat down with him at hospital and they, they had, for the first time in their life, a decent conversation. That was her basic words to me. As soon as she said that, her daughter, eight year old, just burst out into tears and crying. And she was inconsolable. She was eating breakfast before then, quite calmly and just burst out into tears. The daughter had no idea why she was crying. She just cried. And mum, she ran to her mum's lap, jumped on her mum's lap and hugged her and just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. Right? And the mother's looking at me going, what, what, what's going on? What, what's going on? And I said, well, just go back to what you told me. This is all happening while the daughter was sobbing. So the daughter was continuing crying on mum's shoulder while we were having this conversation still. And I said, I said, what did you feel when for the first time in your life you were able to have a decent conversation with your father? And it just happened that two days later he died. And she burst out crying. And the instant she burst out crying, her daughter stopped crying, got off of her lap and went back and sat down and started eating as if nothing had actually happened. And that shocked the mother so much that she stopped crying. <laughs> Because it just, it was a, she just, like, how confusing was that? Can you see what was happening, though? The daughter was a perfect response to the mother's emotion. You see it a lot, too, with the uh, physical problems in the child as well, which we'll talk about a bit later. Yeah, but very often when we don't, know, we don't have that knowledge about what's actually happening emotionally and energetically, the temptation is to calm the child down and say, there's nothing wrong, you're okay, it's okay. And so you... Your soul is sending them one message and you're telling them another message, so it's very damaging. Does that make sense what Mary just said? You're just holding them in your arms, saying, that's okay, when what are you feeling? Oh, I'm not, not okay, I need to cry. You know what I mean? Right at the same time, they're feeling that barrage of different, of untruth. There's something untruthful here to them, very confusing. Can you see that? And that's why it's so important to be in truth with it. You notice uh, too that I've talked about um, when the parent shuts down the child's experience. So the child comes up to you crying and you start saying, oh there, there, you don't have to cry, it wasn't that bad. What you're actually doing now is creating a very damaging situation in your child and that is the child's experiencing an emotion by the way which is yours that you were chose to not experience, right? Which in itself is unfair, isn't it, in the first instance. Then they come up to you, and they'll always focus on the parent, generally, or the person who they're feeling the emotion from. They come up to you, and you actually stop them from experiencing that emotion. So you're actually shutting down 
their experience of your own emotion. Does that make sense? Now what that does is it creates another emotion in them of, of rage. And this is why children at a very young age start becoming very enraged with their parents. And this usually happens by the time the child is two or three years of age. And that's why the child during that particular period of time often goes into these states that are uncontrollable by the parents. The terrible twos they're often referred to. Them. And there's lots of other explanations as to why they happen. The reason why they happen generally is because we have an emotion, the child is reflecting the emotion to us, but we also have an emotion of denial of our own emotion, which we want to also deny in the child, which creates rage in the child. Because the child can't now experience its own emotion without being shut down by us. It's a very, very damaging thing that we're doing in that place. So when a child is experiencing emotion, the thing we need to do instead is to say to ourselves, I feel this emotion. Just not even ask the child what the problem is. You already know what the problem is. If the child's crying, you're denying sadness. So you'd be better off asking the child, if you ask the child, ask it, what is it feeling? What is it feeling? And everything it reflects back at you is what you are not feeling that's in you. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, I know that many of you don't believe this, but if you put it into practice, you'll find very rapidly that it's true. Where you'll see this relationship occur between you and the child. So you notice in that section I've got, the parent assumes the child has a problem, when in reality, every single time, it's the parent's problem. Now that's pretty confronting as a parent to, to take on board, isn't it? Don't you think? You think back of every single problem the child had. So let's say they broke their leg. Right? Your five-year-old child fell down the stairs, broke the leg. That was your emotion that created that event. Mm -hmm. That's pretty confronting, isn't it? To actually go into that emotion. Or let's say the child is six years old and gets this terrible vomiting wipe. And for days it looks like, you know, they're going to be dehydrated and so, and so you're taken to a hospital and you're so worried. Well, you know what, that was your emotion. Or let's say even that a child gets a disease, maybe even a terminal disease. Well, that's your emotion too. Or your, it would be better to put it, denied emotion. Does that make sense? Now that's pretty hard to take on board as a parent, isn't it? Because, uh, like, I've, you know, tomorrow when I go through this with Tristan, you'll see the kinds of things I've had to take on board. Uh, you'll see that. And yes, you can ask the question. When a child wants to suicide? When a, when a child wants to suicide, there's something about your emotion. Yep, always. Now, the key is to not judge yourself. You see, when you judge yourself, you prevent your emotion. So, judging yourself is pointless here. But it is important to admit this is my emotion. Just admit to yourself. And in fact, do you know what? Uh, I feel that the best possible thing you could do to your own spiritual progression is to have a child and feel all of their emotion and feel, and feel the reflection of all of their emotion back at you. And to actually act emotionally in response to it. That's one of the best possible things you can do in your own progression. I'm not suggesting you have a child for that reason, because that would be unloving. But it is a very, very powerful thing for you to do. Yeah. Yeah, Karen. It's more powerful than living with AJ. It is more powerful. It's a moment by moment reflection of your emotions. Yeah. Um, I have a daughter who's 15, and uh, she's come back from school and um, had some. Um, Oh, in this instance, she felt a bit of bullying. And, and I explained to her, I said, um, um, there's probably something I'm not dealing with. Um, and but she said, but I, it's so painful now. And I said, well, because I personally feel quite overwhelmed with all the emotions that have been coming to me, I have difficulty in 
getting hold of particulars. I just know it's everywhere around me. And I said to her, well, um, I have to deal with this. Um, she says, but do, can I do something? And I said, yes, you can try and feel it yourself. And she says, but I don't know how to feel it. I've stopped her from trying when she was little. So I went through it and I tried to explain. She said, well, how do I reach these emotions? And I said, I'm not very good at it myself. Um, but I tried to go through my own scenario of what I felt to get down to the emotion of feeling something. And um, I did get to a point where I was in tears and I was crying and my daughter fell asleep. <laughs> and um, she said to me, um, well, I don't know if I can deal with this. And she's been a bit depressed and I kept thinking, am I making it worse for her? Because I can't deal with it. But when she asked me, she stopped me now. She said, Mum, I don't want to hear anymore. I'm sick and tired of Asia. I don't want to hear anymore. And um, you and your stuff, you know. And, um, and so whenever she says, oh, I've had this and this and this, and then she goes, oh, it's so dreadful. And then I said, do you want to know why? And then she'll say, no. So I don't tell her anymore. But the problem I have is I feel I understand more and more, and as I try to go into my emotions to experience them, uh, I feel a great sadness that she has to, to go through what I'm feeling, yeah. but I can't reach it fast enough for her to, you know, and she's just angry, if you know what I mean. Yeah, so the first emotion you need to feel is that you're not doing it right. Does that make sense? Yes. See, the, what you're saying to me is basically, you can't access your emotions fast enough to, to make your daughter's life easier on her. How does that feel as a mum? Terrible. It feels terrible, yeah. doesn't it? So you need to allow yourself to connect to that emotion. How terrible do you feel? You're asking me how terrible do I feel. Mm. Very guilty. Yeah. Mm. And, and do you feel like you're hurt inside, like you're responsible for her life now? It's like. Mm. Yeah, so now you start to see, just in me saying that, you're starting down to connect to that emotion. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is an emotion you firstly need to feel. Mm -hmm. If you feel that emotion, that's the one that's on the top. Then whatever is underneath will start coming up as well. See, often what we do as parents is we try to skip to the emotion when the emotion that we've... The emotion is quite obvious in most, in most cases what, what we're avoiding. In this case, you are just avoiding feeling like you're a bad mum. So allow yourself to connect to that emotion and feel that, that you're bad enough. It doesn't mean it's true, it means that you believe it's true. Right? So let yourself feel that and connect to that emotion. Connect to it, feel it, and let it flow in you. Let that emotion flow in you. As that emotion flows in you, now you've got some emotion flowing. Right? And it might take a day, two days, a week or something of that emotion where you might feel that. Allow yourself to feel it. Allow that emotion to flow. It's interesting that you're not, you've now switched it back off again while I'm having the explanation, but Jen just walked out the door feeling the emotion. Right? So she's now feeling the emotion, which is that she's a bad mum, which is the same emotion you have, and in the end you'll probably feel it like, you can hear her now, you'll feel it like she's been there, just like that. Does that make sense? Now when you feel it like that, the feelings of responsibility for your daughter's emotion and your daughter's life will start changing. At the moment, she's angry with you because she knows you are responsible for the creation of a lot of these things and, not, and are not owning it yet. And that's why she's angry. You don't need to deal with the anger. All you need to do is feel the emotion. If you feel the emotion, her anger will dissipate as you deal with the emotion. Does that make sense? Let yourself do that. It's really important to let that emotion flow. Is there any other questions about the back features? Hi. You said something, I've got two things. You said something a couple of weeks ago at Utilo about not being responsible for the kids when they're, I can't remember what age it was, quite young, five. No, I've never said that. I've said that as time goes, progresses, there's not a single time when you're not responsible for your child's emotion if your emotion came from you. So from God's perspective, 
There's not a single time from God's perspective when you're not responsible for your child's emotion, no matter what age they are, if the emotion came from you. And that's better, isn't it? When you think about it. However, as they get older, so when they get to five, six, seven years of age, and they start making transitions into their own free will. And now they start, to, there's a blending, there's an interblending of the choices they're making into the law of compensation and into their own law of attraction. And that process slowly increases and increases until they reach maturity and they've left home. But the majority of causal emotion sitting in them is still your own as a parent. Does that make sense? So, but, but their choices they make as a result of that are going to be very different depending on what personality they have and how they respond to those injuries. So, for example, you can get two people who have been sexually abused. One of them will go off and sexually abuse someone else and another one won't abuse anybody at all. So why is that? It's because they, they both have the same sort of injury, but one of them is making a different choice than the other. And that choice is still an important part of their life. And, so that, and they are responsible for their choices. But when they're children, they are, they are just mostly reflecting our own choices. They're reflecting our own denied emotion. Does that make sense? The other, I had one other, other thing. Yep. When you were saying, um, uh, let them do things, I remember a few minutes ago, uh, about tantrums. I just wanted to ask, when you've got like a two-year-old who wants a sharp knife, mm -hmm. and you don't want them to have it because of the fear, they don't know how to handle a sharp knife, they don't know the cause and effect, um, consequence, what do you do in that situation then? And they put on a tantrum, or have that emotion because they're being denied, What's the, um, what's the emotion of the tantrum? Anger, I guess. So it's anger. It's actually quite extreme anger, isn't it? It's like rage. And what would you say? It's, type, it's a sort of a rebellion type of emotion, isn't it? Where I'm rebelling against an authority. So the first thing to look at within yourself is those qualities, the what's going on inside, yourself, inside of yourself. Does that make sense? When... So if they are rebelling, they are rebelling against something. Now, a lot of times what they will be rebelling against is emotions in you. Now, the emotion you described in you was fear. You were afraid that if you gave them a knife, they'd cut themselves. And then what would you do? Right? You don't want to see them hurt. So you're afraid of seeing your child hurt. Allow yourself to go into those emotions. Now, you can choose there and then if you want to take away the knife and let them have their tantrum. But if you don't deal with all the emotions that caused the tantrum and them wanting the knife, then in the end you're just going to create another event where they get the knife when you're not there. So in that situation, if I took the knife away but allowed them to still experience those emotions, mm, but, go through not... it, but then while they're doing that or at an appropriate time, go through that fear and go into myself and why... When is the appropriate I'm... time? Well, probably in the moment. Exactly. See, see, it's unfair for us to expect... Uh, take away the knife, put the knife in the drawer. Unf unfair for us to expect the child to have a tantrum while I'm not dealing with the emotion that caused their tantrum. Can you see that? I need to deal with the emotion that caused their tantrum. Now, oftentimes what causes their tantrum is that... Things like a child grabbing a knife will often be done because they are not getting enough attention, for example. Right? Where they feel there's not enough attention and they want to do something that's unsafe to get your attention. Now, that means that they're often not feeling loved in the first place when they actually go to do it. So allow yourself to see that going on within you. And it's probably a good time to bring up an example, an overseas example, another one. And myself and seven other people, six other people, were driving in a car, driving from Miami in the States to uh, Cape Canaveral, you know, where they shoot up the, rock, the shuttle. And the reason why we're driving up is I had some talks to do up there. And so what happened, we were driving in this car, and in the car there was five, six adults and one three-year-old boy. 
One of, them, one of the persons in the car was his mother, and she was sitting right down the front, and the boy, the three-year-old boy, was sitting right up the back. His name is Luca, and the mum's name, she won't mind me mention it, is Fiona. Now, Fiona has a lot of uh, feelings towards men about being angry with men and not wanting to give love to men. Wanting to be loved by a man, but not give love to a man because of some childhood events in her. So what would often happen is that she would feel this feeling inside herself of not wanting to love men, and Luca would straight away feel unloved. You follow me? As soon as he felt unloved, what he, would, what he learned to do was the best way to get love was to actually get attention. And the best way to get attention was to do something that really struck mum and got her attention. So he would often come in yelling and screaming at her. Or he'd go and belt another child in order to get her attention. And in the end, he got a lot of negative attention because of it, obviously. But it was still attention. And it helped him. It, he, he feels, just feeling his feelings, that it was better that way than having no attention at all. So what we decided to do in this car trip was that I pointed out to Fiona that, that he was manipulating her all the time to get love. I also pointed out to her the reason why he was, because she wasn't giving any real love. And it's because of her issues with men. So the first thing we did was we talked about her issues with men and what was going on with men and everything like that. Now, what happened as soon as she started feel, started she started feeling some of her anger with men, really quite strongly while we're in the car. As soon as she did that, little Luca went into this rage. He was in the back and he started screaming and yelling at mother, saying he wanted this and he wanted that, and he started throwing his toys down to the front of the car and and they were all tempted to stop the car and deal with it. I said, no, 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 let's keep on going with this, you know. So there were six of us in the car, putting up with this screaming, rageful child. And we finished up letting him be in this screaming rage for an hour and a half. 